All right, we're starting a new four-week series uh, called Reasonable Faith. And so our uh, Tallgrass mission statement that we've uh, basically taken from the scriptures and adopted as our own, because God first loved us, we exist to love God and love our neighbors. Hence this picture of a neighborhood. Now I think Dave swapped or grabbed a photo from Timber Creek 3. It looks like that to me, uh, which is okay. Uh, but wherever tall grass folks are, we are called to love our neighbors because of God's great love for us. So uh, several weeks ago, we talked about the unique love of God, the, the agape love of God, and how it's different than anything this world has to offer that, that we call love. But we've not yet even talked about why believe in God. So tonight, we're going to talk about why believe in God. So, and then next week, here's the, here's the, the, the uh, subsequent weeks tonight. Why believe in God? And then why believe in the Bible? Why believe in Jesus? And then we'll have a week uh, talking about the nature of faith. Um, so the, the goals with this series and the, the reason that we thought we'd uh, throw another sermon series in before we get into a book of the Bible expositorily um, is just to kind of set the tone, set the stage for the types of questions we really want to dig into as a church and also so that you know we want to equip you to engage your neighbors who have these types of questions. So part of the goal is to equip the saints for the works of ministry as you're in your neighborhoods. Um, also to strengthen our own faith. I mean, some of us, you know, why do we believe what we believe? Well, because that's how I grew up. Well, that's not a good reason to believe something because a lot of folks grow up, you know, in crazy homes or, in cra you know, where beliefs are crazy. That's not a good reason. We should believe in something because it's true, you know. So we want to strengthen our own faith as well for those of us who believe in Christ and also to move us towards greater awe of our creator. So especially tonight's topic, why believe in God? Uh, not only is this to address the questions that neighbors may have, or maybe you have uh, as you lay awake at night wondering and having doubts, but also to move us towards greater awe of our amazing creator. Uh, so that's, where, that's kind of where we're headed. A few encouragements for our spiritual journey as we go, don't dump your brains out at the door. So we're, we're never asking anyone to take a blind leap of faith. We're always talking about a reasoned response to evidence, a step of faith. That's what we're asking folks to do. So, so uh, whenever people insinuate that to follow Christ is just um, to check your brains at the door, no, we want to engage with that, push back on that big time. A number two thing, encouragement for you is don't be afraid to take a step of faith. 100% certainty is not possible about anything. I believe that's to be true philosophically speaking. So if there's no room for any doubts, then there's no room for real faith. Um, you know, you think about buying a car. At some point, you've got to make the purchase. You can't be guaranteed of the result. You have to take a step of faith, and then you're conf either confirmed in your step if the car goes well and it's driving, or you realize that step was wrong. The car's a lemon. You know, it's falling apart. You know, so every day we're taking steps of faith without 100% certainty. Has anyone eaten at Taco John's? That's my point exactly. It's a big step of faith, but you take it. You're hungry. You commit. It's a risk. There's doubts. Okay. So we all exercise faith. Don't be afraid to take a step of faith. Three, don't give up the search. We want to be a church that takes the big questions in life seriously. We want to ponder deeply what is the meaning of my life. Why believe in this stuff? What, why even follow God? We want to take those questions seriously. And we, you know, uh, in, in many ways, I think about um, interactions I have with people that they just don't think about life. They don't care to think. They're just on autopilot, consuming, apathetic. You know, honestly, I'm, I'm tired of apathetic people. And if you are one, maybe that's offensive. But if you're truly apathetic, you don't care anyways. So, all right. It's all right. Consider this, if there's even a tiny chance that the claims of the Bible that we teach and preach from, the claims of Christ, even the smallest chance that it's true, 
then wouldn't it warrant and, and shouldn't you give some time to investigate? If there's even the smallest chance that what the Bible claims to be true is true, it should take uh, effort. We should study. You know, what do you got to lose? A few hours of study, you know, uh, getting to know a few crazy religious folks that, you know, do church stuff. Uh, you don't have much to lose. So don't give up the search. Dig in. So uh, tonight, I'm going to kind of make the case that faith in God is the most reasonable response to the evidence around and within us. There's absolutely no problem with reconciling scientific discovery and faith in God. In fact, as we'll see, the deeper that we dig into science, the more reasonable our faith in God appears to be. So that's where we're headed. And again, faith, maybe you've picked this up already. Faith, uh, a lot of times in our culture, uh, people use the word faith to talk about wishful thinking in something that you probably don't actually think is true. You know, like I have faith or I have hope that the Cleveland Cavs can beat the Warriors next year. Uh, that is not, that's, that's not likely. That's wishful thinking. Again, faith, as we use it, is a reasoned response based on evidence. And this is how, this is how Jesus, Paul, the others uh, convince and move people towards faith as they show them signs and evidences. So that's where we're going tonight. And um, tonight we are not even going to crack the Bible until the very end. And so that, you know, because we're going to build a case and, and try to equip you all as you engage with people in your neighborhoods who maybe they don't believe in God, or maybe they're questioning, or maybe they don't take the Bible seriously. They don't believe it's inspired. So how do you meet them right where they are and give them clues about the existence of God? So that's where we're headed. Let me pray for us, and we'll keep going. Father, thanks for the evening. Thanks for everything, everyone who's gathered here tonight. We thank you that um, you have given us your word that you've made it clear how we got here. You spoke, and you said, let there be light, and there was light. You created, and that you created the universe so perfectly finely tuned that we can have this conversation tonight, that our hearts are beating, our minds are functioning, we're able to think existentially about our lives. It's amazing. So, Father, I pray that you would help us tonight to, to lean in, um, to dig in, to really consider, consider you. And not only did you create this world, you didn't just set it in motion and leave it be, but you are active in creation and that you want to reward those who seek you and desire faith a relationship with you. So I pray that, we, that you would help us uh, bolster our faiths, but also uh, engage well with our neighbors and their questions. So guide our time tonight. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll look at a few clues that would point us to belief in a creator God. These aren't proofs. These aren't going to give us certainty, uh, but they are clues that we're going to kind of pile up, try to firmly uh, root them in our minds. And I'm going to fly a little bit here. So first of all, let's look outside at the universe. The first thing we're going to look at, clue number one, the origin of the universe. Either God created the universe or it just happened. Both of those require faith. And so we're going to talk about uh, the Big Bang. And interestingly, uh, every group of people in the whole world, every worldview, every world religion, every uh, realm of thought, uh, has all thought that the world was, um, or the universe was eternal, with one exception that we'll get to later. So every, every worldview, every re religious system every, every, that I've discovered, that I've searched out, everyone has always thought that the universe was eternal, with one exception until modern science. Are you tracking with me? So common thought throughout history, except for one group of people, is that the universe itself is eternal, meaning it has no beginning. 
But we come to modern science. So here, bear with me, because I'm no scientist. And if I get something technically wrong, we can dig in, you can correct me, and we'll, we'll keep going. Here we are, second law of thermodynamics, 1850 or so. Uh, it's one reason that scientists began to believe perhaps our universe had a beginning. This law basically states that the amount of usable energy will decrease in a closed system. So our stars, for example, they start uh, noticing that they seem to be mid-burn, like they've gone through half of their lifespan, meaning they won't burn forever. So if you look at the fact that they're burning and they're, they're going to stop burning, you, you look back the other way and you say, well, they had to have a beginning then. Uh, as one agnostic physicist uh, puts it, the universe is like a clock slowly winding down. That's what the second law of thermodynamics starts to indicate for scientists. The question is, well, how did it get wound up in the first place if it's winding down? All right, so that's 1850 or so. Brings us to a guy named Albert Einstein, 1917. Theory of relativity, which I'm not going to state, but I'm just gonna, basically, this uh, theory of relativity demonstrating that the universe was either in a state of expansion or contraction. And uh, Einstein, he resisted this conclusion. I mean, everyone's resisting this conclusion because like I said, everyone believed the universe was eternal, never had a beginning. So he resisted this conclusion and continued to insist that the universe was static. Later he called this the biggest blunder of my life. The universe wasn't static, it was in a state of motion. So within a decade, um, two mathematicians developed a theory based on Einstein's gravitational formula, a theory that the universe was in fact in a state of expansion. Okay, so we're at 1917, 100 years ago. First such proposition ever, with the one exception that I mentioned earlier. The, the, the notion that the universe itself is expanding. First time this has been proposed, with the one exception, okay? Takes us to, you guys tracking with the science here? Cosmological redshift, about 10 years after uh, the theory of relativity. Edwin Hubble, uh, I think the, his, um, this, was it the satellite or the telescope was named after him later? Is that right? Okay. Um, so Edwin Hubble discovered the light of very distant stars were redshifted or was redshifted, meaning the, that means that they're going away from us very, very quickly. You know, when you listen to a car honking its horn or a train and it dips in pitch when it goes away from you because the sound waves are like larger or longer or something. I'm looking back at Dave because he's way more sciencey than me, so you'll get to hear from him next week. He's giving me a thumbs up. All right, good. So the same is true with these with the stars. So if the stars are coming towards you, it might be blue shifted or negative red shifted, I think, technically. But if they're going away from you very quickly, then the, the light appears red. And so he was able to observe this. Um, you know, as it, as it turns out, they're, the universe is expanding rapidly, very quickly. Okay, I wonder what's going on with that. This brings us to what is called cosmic microwave background. Um, so first kind of discovered accidentally by a couple uh, radio guys in 64, later confirmed in 1989, a satellite detected a haze of background radiation covering the entirety of the universe. And one, um, one author says, the most impressive direct piece of observational support for the Big Bang is the universal presence of radiation permeating space. So one way to think about this, let's say it's getting close to 4th of July, the kids have some firecrackers, they're down in the basement, and I hear a Big Bang, and I run down there, and they've already scampered out the door and they're halfway down the block. I don't see them, but what do I see? I see the evidence, I see the residual, I see the smoke, I see the little you know, stuff flittering to the ground and I'm like, aha, someone shot off fireworks. You tracking with me? It's my best attempt at cosmic microwave background. This has led modern scientists to say the universe 
had a beginning. This is significant. Never before had this been proposed, except for one uh, exception that we'll get to. So the origin of the universe, the facts of the Big Bang. Discovery of the Big Bang, it's not a religious theory. You could find this theory in any science textbook. This view is a consensus in modern cosmology, except for a few quacks. Okay? So listen to this. Stephen Hawking, famous agnostic uh, physicist, almost everyone now believes that the universe in time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Might go quickly here. Another agnostic physicist, Paul Davies, in the past, the universe was smaller. If we run the expansion in reverse for 13.7 billion years, then the ball shrinks to a single point, a single sizeless dot, and then Nothing. The ball has vanished. Another guy, agnostic physicist John Barrow says, at this singularity, space and time came into existence. Literally nothing existed before the singularity. So if the universe originated at such a single singularity, we truly have a creation ex nihilo, or out of nothing which is what theologians talk about in biblical terms, creation ex nihilo. That's a religious phrase, out of nothing. That's what we have. That's what, that's what modern science has all of a sudden discovered. So our choices back in the day and our question, you know, why believe in God, you know, you had a couple choices. We can either believe in God or universe is eternal and we can believe in matter and energy. That was the options back in the day. But now, in light of modern science, our choices are you can believe in God or nothing. So now we're going to talk about which is more reasonable, believe in God or nothing. Quentin Smith, atheistic philosopher, his conjecture or uh, proposition is the most reasonable belief is that we came from nothing, by nothing, and for nothing. He's writing books and selling them. That's the most reasonable belief. Is this the most reasonable belief? Is the most reasonable belief uh, to believe that something created something or nothing created something? Atheists used to argue that the Bible was unreasonable because it said God cre could create something from nothing. That's the claim. That's foolish. How can you create something from nothing? But now the claim is that no one created something out of nothing. Uh, uh, illustration William Lane Craig says, you know, it's, it's easier to believe a magician pulled a rabbit out of the hat using real magic than to believe the atheistic account of the Big Bang. Because at least you, have, you already have a magician, you have a hat, and all you're doing is producing a rabbit. But the proposition that nothing created everything, you don't even have a magician or a hat or a rabbit. You got nothing. Matter and energy can't create matter and energy. It truly takes something supernatural to create everything. By the way, once you establish and believe that God created everything out of nothing, the miracle accounts in the scriptures are, are pretty simple to wrap the mind around because that's the big deal to create everything out of nothing, okay? This brings us to that group that I mentioned earlier, um, the early adopters to the idea that the universe had a beginning. The ancient Jews... So remember the group of people I mentioned? Yeah, okay. So those, the, the Jews, they've always held that the universe had a beginning long before scientific experiments were even a thing. So if we were to be transported 3,000 years back in the day and say, uh, hello, Jewish man, uh, how did you know that the universe had a beginning? We just discovered this stuff. You know what he would say? God told us. That's the answer, right? So Robert Jastrow, agnostic physicist, he says, this is an exceedingly strange develop, unexpected by all but the theologians. They've always accepted the word of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven, or created heaven and earth. He goes on. 
For the scientist uh, who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. You know, we're getting smarter, smarter, smarter. He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself up over the final rock, the height of scientific discovery, he is greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. These guys are just sitting there. What's the big deal? I could have told you the universe had a beginning. Bam. Wow, how humbling is that? So let's just accept the conclusions, right? They correspond with one another. It's for this reason that the conclusions of the Big Bang were strongly opposed by scientists because of these implications. So, again, these don't all qu- count as quotes. I know I got a lot of quotes, but so these don't count in my quote tally, okay? I'm going to give a few here. <laughs> Arthur Eddington, Astrophysics, thir- 1931. Listen, is there any emotion in here? Is there any, is this just pure cold science? He says, I have no ax to grind in this discussion. What he should say is, I have an ax to grind in this discussion. He says, but the notion of a beginning is repugnant to me. I don't like that thought. I simply do not believe that the present order of things started off with a bang. The expanding universe is preposterous, incredible. It leaves me cold. That's not, that doesn't sound like a, cold, calculated scientist who's whatever the data says I'm going to embrace. No, he's emotionally involved. He has an ax to grind. Uh, His whole life is built on a previous notion. Um, Walter Nernst, a German chemist and physicist, says, to deny the infinite duration of time would be to betray the very foundations of science as if science is a person that can be related to that you would betray. There's emotion involved here, right? Philip Morrison of MIT. I find it hard to accept the Big Bang Theory. I would like to reject it. If he had his druthers, he would like to reject it. Last one. Alan Sandage of Carnegie Observatories wrote, It is a strange conclusion. It cannot really be true. Well, you all did the experiments, came to the conclusions. Bang, there it is. Okay, so the the point is these atheistic scientists, they don't seem too comfortable with the Big Bang and the implications because they know where it leads us. You know, and I wouldn't be comfortable with it either, either if I refused to believe in the God who created everything out of nothing, including myself, you know, to whom I will be accountable for. I would, I would not be comfortable either. One last quote here, um, showing that even now they're scrambling to deal with the ramifications of the Big Bang in the science community. So in uh, the book, The Grand Design, uh, famous author Stephen Hawking writes, now listen closely, figure this one out, okay? Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. Okay? John Lennox, a theistic mathematician, his response to this quote, Nonsense remains nonsense even when spoken by famous scientists, even though the general public assumes they are statements of science. The evidence is there. The clue is there. Modern science has come to the conclusion thousands of years later what God told the Jews in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right, so that's clue one. Why believe in God? The origin of the universe, the Big Bang. Clue two, fine-tuning of the universe. So the other day, I was, uh, this was a couple months ago, I was at Tuttle Creek, the beach. Beautiful spot, right? Not in my top ten, but it's still pretty. But I had this moment where I just looked around and I, I thought, man, there is so much life around me. 
just all sorts of plants were growing up, and I thought, you know, if you were just to drop some seeds, you'd come back, you'd see life is just springing. You look out at the trees, and it's like, this is amazing. And there's nowhere else in the universe that we know of where any of that could happen. That's mind-blowing. And as it turns out, the chances of the universe being so finely tuned that we can experience this moment together are just just so unlikely. So let's talk a little bit about this. So fine-tuning of the universe. Certain forces in physics, the laws and constants in initial conditions of the universe, like things like gravity, rate of expansions of our universe, must be perfectly fine-tuned for life to exist anywhere in the universe. So if we consider one of those uh, constants, uh, the, the force of gravity. Uh, so when Jesus spoke the universe into existence, and I know we've not talked about why I believe in Jesus yet, but at the Big Bang, um, the, the, the force of gravity, before there's, there's any stars, planets, galaxies, just atoms floating in dark void of space. As the universe expands outward from the Big Bang, gravity starts to pull ever so gently on the atoms gathering them into clumps that eventually become stars, galaxies. But gravity had to have just the right force. If it was just a tiny amount stronger, it would have pulled all the atoms together in one big ball. If it was just slightly weaker, it all ended in a, a big crunch. Did I get that right? Did I get that right? Oh, he doesn't know, okay. Oh no, if, it, if, it, if a gravity was a bit weaker, I'm sorry, the expanding uh, universe would have distributed the atoms so widely that nothing would have gathered at all. So when we talk about the strength of gravity having to be exactly right for stars to form, what do we mean by exactly? So think about this. It turns out that if we change gravity, even a tiny fraction of a percent, enough, enough to say that you know maybe you would be a billionth of a gram heavier or lighter, if we change gravity that much, the universe becomes so different. There are no stars, no galaxies, no planets. Without planets, no life, no conversation denied at Tallgrass Church. And that's just gravity, just one constant, so precisely um, fine-tuned. The other constants of nature possess the same feature, change any of them, and the universe becomes this very different path no life as we know it. A few examples so that actually there's 30 to 50 of these constants that are finely tuned. Uh, I, and in my notes, which are, will be online, I have a list of 34, you know, and, and this, uh, I believe this list is growing as they're discovering more. All of these uh, knobs, if you will, that something, someone had to dial just precisely, all, working all together for life to exist as we know it, um, all of these had to be exactly as they are as we know it. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we just take one of these, uh, each one of these has a, a number attached that represents its improbability. Uh, I had a little illustration. I didn't know if I'd get to it. Okay, so we have Legos here. If you were to think about, okay, what are the chances I throw these Legos on the ground and it, it creates something awesome? You're going to put your money on that? Let's see if it happens, you know, okay? And by the way, anyone is welcome to come up here and try this for the remainder of our talk tonight. And if it forms a big castle, then we're done. I'll, we'll shut down tall grass, right? Because it's so unlikely it's not going to happen. Well, that's the same with each of these constants for them to be so precisely fine-tuned. So listen to this. Uh, just one of these smaller improbabilities um, is this unlikely. So imagine covering the entirety of North American continent in dimes all the way up to the moon. That's 239,000 feet, miles, excuse me, miles, covered in dimes. So by comparison, the, the U.S. federal government debt in 2001 
would be dimes uh, one square mile less than two feet deep. I know it's bigger than that now. So that's the U.S. debt. Okay, so cover North America in dimes all the way up to the moon. Now do that over a billion other continents. Are you tracking with these, this number of dimes? Okay. Then blindfold a friend, paint one, red, one dime red, throw it in the billions of you know, continents piled up to the moon, and then tell him, pick out the red dime. And it is, it, that likelihood is just one of these constants out of the 30 to 50 constants. So all of these have to be calibrated together exactly for life to exist as we know it. So this is, this is, these odds are so crazy that it's forcing scientists to come up with possible explanations. And not too many uh, messages are you going to hear these explanations listed, but I'm, I'm going to list them because this is the stuff that, pe- this is what people are saying. Perhaps this is a reasonable uh, a response to the fine-tuning of the universe. First one, multiverse theory. There's a universe generator out there that generates an infinity number of universes, and we just happen to be in the one that is so precisely fine-tuned to have this conversation now. There's absolutely no evidence for this, but some theories hope maybe someday we'll find some evidence, although not likely. Even if we did, what are we going to do? So this is a legit theory to try to make sense of the fine-tuning of the universe, the multiverse generator. Of course, who developed the multiverse generator? It doesn't really deal with that question. Oscillating universe theory, that we're just... It's a a big bang, a big crunch. Of course, that's like billions of years, right? Back and forth. Each of those represents billions and billions of years. And we just happen to be in the right here. That just happens to be this exact moment. There's no evidence for oscillating universe theory. But it's out there. It's being considered seriously. Okay, this one's awesome. Simulation hypothesis. So reality is, in fact, an an artificial simulation, most likely a computer game or a computer simulation, perhaps produced by people 50 years down the road. And so we're living it. You know, AI AI is getting better. Um, Virtual reality is getting better. So that's essentially what the universe as we know it. So there's a designer. They've designed this video game that we're in. This is... Serious consideration as a hypothesis. The, the major problems, you know, for the end of humanity as we know it, according to this hypothesis, is we better keep this thing interesting or they might shut the game down. Or once we develop our own simulation, we'll overload the computers for our designers and the whole thing will be done. And th- this is serious consideration because we got to deal with the finely tuned universe. Again, no evidence, no evidence. Another one, alien design. One hypothesis, the universe may have been designed by extra universal aliens. So this would solve the problem of needing a designer or a design team. Uh, Some cosmologists believe humans will in time be able to generate new universes. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't answer the question of where the universe came from, but that we're here because of intelligent or uh, alien design. Again, there's way more evidence for the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, and Tupac and Elvis coming together to record an album that comes out next year than alien design. Yeah, but, but an extraterrestrial designer. Like a supernatural creator? Is that what you have in view? Uh, That's God, you know? The supernatural engineer of the universe. It works because he designed it to work. So that leads us to the conclusion. Creator God. The heavens declare the glory of God. In so many ways that modern science is getting a greater look at just how glorious it is. Think of that. As they're discovering this stuff. Wow, this this is way more intricate than we ever thought. Whether you look at the micro level 
the cellular level, DNA level, or you look big picture. It's amazing. And of course, uh, in Romans 1, it talks about how God, uh, you know, it's, he's shown people his attributes. It's clearly plain to them, but they've rejected God and they've become foolish in their thinking, darkened in their thinking, so that they think crazy thoughts, like we just kind of walked through a few of them. <clears throat> so Paul Davies, this, is, this does count on my quote tally. Agnostic phys physicist says, in the end, it boils down to a question of belief. Is it easier to believe in a cosmic designer than the multiplicity of universes necessary? If we cannot visit the other universes or experience them directly, their possible existence must remain just as much a matter of faith as belief in God. And I would argue it takes more faith to believe in the multiverse theory, oscillating universe theory, alien design, than that the creator God who has spoken um, believe, uh, created this stuff. The seemingly miraculous concurrence of numerical values that nature has assigned, assigned to her fundamental constants must remain the most compelling evidence for an element of cosmic design. Uh, no one's taken me up on this, by the way, because it's not going to happen, right? God created the universe. That's why it works. He is the designer. He's the creator. Okay, so origin of the universe, fine-tuning of the universe. Now we'll look a little bit on the inside. Talk just a little bit about morality. So the, mora the moral argument based upon um, moral values and duties. And, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. So if you ever watched the Nature Channel and you see a lion hunt down ruthlessly a gazelle, premeditated, waiting, slaughtering the gazelle. The gazelle has children, eating it, blood and guts everywhere. The audacity, the outrage. Let's get that off the TV. You, you don't feel that? What if, what if someone went into your home premeditated, went to your children's room, killed, slaughtered your child, blood, guts, everywhere. Is there any moral outrage there? Absolutely. Why? What's the difference? I mean, the gazelle has a little more body hair, can run faster. Your child has a larger brain, walks upright, can use an iPhone. <laughs> but what's the difference? There's a huge difference. It's called morality. And we all get it. We all have morality. This is, this is a clue that points to God. Otherwise, we have to come up with other possible explanations. Again, really quickly, we have to account where do we get that sense of morality, as broken as it may be. Some would say morality from evolution. It's just hardwired into us. So no difference between Mother Teresa and her set of urges to take care of thousands of dying HIV patients over decades. No difference from her set of urges and the urges of Jeffrey Dahmer to rape, murder, dismember, eat the bodies of 17 men and boys over a decade and a half. But he didn't eat all of them. He, he froze some of them. There's no difference those urges are just there. Uh, evolution is not a satisfactory explanation for morality. Again, I'm flying on this because I'm going to wrap up. But this is one uh, claim. Morality from culture. So whose culture determines what's right or wrong? Uh, you know, we live in a military town. I've talked to several soldiers who come over from different cultures, and they're like, pederasty is uh, commonplace in that culture. Pederasty is um, older men sleeping with young boys, just normative. But it's part of their culture, so that's cool, right? I mean, in our culture, we call these men pedophiles, and we lock them up for decades. Uh, if you want an interesting uh, further research, you know, you can check out the Etoro ethnic group in Papua New Guinea. Uh, you may not want to, um, but it's just their culture, right? So we, don't, we can't really determine what's right or wrong. I don't think culture is a satisfactory explanation for morality. There's several proposals. I'm just giving you a few. 
morality from maximal happiness. So our uh, atheistic biologist, famous guy Richard Dawkins says, Great, the greatest happiness of the greatest number is the foundation of morals and legislation. I don't know what gives him the right to come up with that. Maybe he's God, but this is what he says. But again, the greatest number of who? There's 10 quintillion individual insects on the earth. There's like 7.4 billion homo sapiens. The insects outnumber us a billion, by a billion times, oh, sorry. Yeah, a billion times more bugs on earth than people. So maximal happiness of insects should be what we live for, right? You guys are kind of spaced now. It doesn't make any sense. Or, you know, according to this um, thought process, say there's seven people in a hospital waiting for organs. One's needing a heart, one a kidney, a liver, so on and so forth. Under this premise, the most moral thing to do would to be walk out into the lobby, grab the most healthy-looking guy who's... Young, you know, young guy with healthy organs, Chris Swanson, one life for the seven. Doesn't make, that is, that is not moral. It's this thought process that on a global scale leads some to, con to conclude we need to euthanize the older uh, population, uh, the handicapped, to free up resources for the maximum number. It's how we get stuff like Hitler going, right? It is not Morality. It's not a, a, a satisfactory explanation for morality. Perhaps we get our sense of morality from God. Even people who've not heard the name of God have a sense, oh man, when I do this, I think it's right. When I don't do this, I think it's wrong. And yeah, there's twisted people that have been hardened, rejected God oh, time and time again. But we get our sense of morality from God, the law is written on the hearts. So that's another clue. If we look inside ourselves and we see our, our cry for justice or our, our demand that that's wrong, that's right, points us to God. So reasonable faith. These are just three clues. I have several other clues listed in the notes here. Clue one, origin of the universe. You're going to put your faith in nothing or God. Clue two, fine-tuning of the universe. You're going to put your faith in the, the multiverse or God. Morality, you're going to put your faith in humanity? Like humanity's going to get it right finally? Despite the evidence? I mean, look at the track record. Or God, you know? That's what we're left with. There's so absolutely no problem embracing science and faith in the God of the Bible. In fact, the scientific evidence increasingly points you to the creator God of whom the Bible speaks. Final clue tonight, ever so briefly, beauty and love. We as humans, we create stuff. There's no practical reason when we create art. It's just it's beautiful. We have this longing for something beyond ourselves. We love, you know, sacrificially in a way that does not make sense um, unless there's truly a God who gives us purpose. C.S. Lewis says, you know, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation, again, it's not a proof, it's just a clue, is that we were made for another world. So finally, the, the Bible. Hebrews 11, uh, verse 1. The Hebrew author says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Right there, creation, out of nothing. So the Hebrew author, they believed that the Bible was authoritative. So he, in Hebrews 11, he looks at evidence after evidence, all of these men and women of faith who went before and put their faith in the God who created and the God who, who wanted to be sought after and the God who wants to reward them. 
And a lot of the people we interact with, they don't yet believe that the Bible is authoritative. So give them some clues. Help them along their journey. Remove some obstacles for them. Hebrews 11.6 says this, Without faith, it's impossible to please him, to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It's a beautiful thing about the creator of the universe, the, the God who finely tuned the universe so that we can live, is that all he requires from us is faith, trust, belief in him. Think about that. Creator of the universe could have required religious ritual, 10 push-ups a day, say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. He could have required whatever he wanted. But all he requires is trust that he's there and that he rewards those who seek him. Those who are on that journey, the non-apathetic seekers who are dealing and struggling with life, he wants to reward those. And the goal of, the, of our faith is relationship. Think about a marriage. Um, my marriage is about not just belief that Maris exists, you know, and that she's out there. It's actually faith in her and a relationship. I know her. I trust her. I engage with her. And yeah, sometimes uh, the feelings aren't there. You know, faith is not rooted in feelings. The feelings will come, yeah, at times, but, but I have to have deep faith in that relationship so that when the feelings aren't there, I can persevere, you know, to enjoy a relationship that I know to be true. So yeah, faith isn't just how do you feel about things. It's a relationship with the God who is there, uh, who wants to reward those who seek him. And this idea of God rewarding those who seek him, basically a, be a, a belief that God is good. When you cry out to the creator God, he wants to reward you with good things. It's not in our passage tonight, but it's throughout the scriptures. It all points to the way that he rewards us is through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And we're going to, two weeks, really dig into why believe in Jesus. But he has made a way so that he can heap his reward on us for those who believe in him. So, um, yeah, as we wrap up tonight and, and move on to singing, um, you know, I know most people that are here believe in God or at least we say we do, maybe there's doubts, and hopefully this can strengthen our faith, but there's so many that we engage with that we know do not believe in God. You know, they don't, they don't, they're scrambling, they're searching. Maybe they're not even thinking deeply about life, but let's be people that challenge them. Why not cry out to the creator God in, the, in a quiet moment with your doubts, with your concerns, with your cares? Why not? You know, what do you have to lose? If you don't believe in God and you cry out to him and he says nothing, you've just wasted a few minutes, right? Maybe people are scared that he would actually respond and show you that he is there, that he wants to reward you. That's quite a proposition to come into contact with the creator God. So... Um, just a few action steps as, as we go in these next few weeks. Process yourself, but also think about people you can engage with and just ask them where they're at. Try to wrap your mind around their worldview. Ask a lot of questions and then be, equip yourself to be able to engage with our friends and our neighbors. We do have great resources available. Uh, we live in the information age. There is no lack of great resources out there. So trying to sift through it all is tough. But this book, The Reason for God, uh, very influential for me. We have it for 10 bucks. And Discovering God um, is uh, one we give away for free. So you can grab it and give it to a friend as well. But let me pray for us and um, <clears throat> we'll move on to, to sing together. Father, thanks so much for the evening together. Thank you for your word and that somehow in your wisdom, you've, you've given us this record um, of your interactions with the Jewish people and it's written down, it's, it's there, we can see it. And then as science makes these discoveries, it just confirms what you've said all along. We thank you for that. I pray that you'd help us strengthen our faith. 
Um, I pray you to help us equip ourselves as a body of believers to engage our neighbors in Manhattan and Wamigo, everything in between and around us very well. And I pray that you would meet us in our hurt and pain as well and that, that as we struggle in and out of faith, that we truly would believe you're good, that you want to reward those who seek you, that our anxiety, uh, our sadness, these things you know, at, at the core are rooted in our lack of trusting your provision. So we, we thank you for your provision in Christ and how because you've graciously, give, graciously given him, you've given us all things. Um, so thank you again. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.